So my name is Mark Shotland. I'm the director of research and training here at JPAL. Uh, I've been with JPAL for what feels like my entire life. I joined about 13 years ago before there was even a JPAL when it was just a couple of professors here at MIT that were looking to run randomized evaluations in various places and I met one of them because one of my colleagues was an undergrad with uh, Esther and Abhijit and I, um, that, that was when I was working in New York. He introduced me, she, uh, Esther, asked me if I would like to move to India to do a, an evaluation of a pro, an education program that you'll actually see a little bit over the course of this week. And I said, you know, for that moment, yes. And I joined and I haven't looked back. So um, that's me. I will ask you all to introduce yourselves in a minute. But first, I'd like to say I'm delighted you're all here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is, this is going to be a fun week. It's going to be a little bit intense in terms of the amount of work we're going to ask you to do, uh, the amount of listening and engagement we'll ask you to, to suffer through. Um, but overall, I think it's going to be fun. And, and if experience is any lesson, um, it'll be worthwhile. So. Um, let's see, Rohit has already introduced you all to the course packet, so you have that ready. You've seen that there is a course agenda that is on page three. At least last I checked it was on page three, hopefully it still is. Um, so the, basically the way the course works, um, there's pretty much four major components to this course. The first um, are the lectures, so we will have eight lectures. Uh, lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, lecture four, lecture five, and lecture six and lecture seven, lecture eight. Surprising. Um, so the first lecture um, I will deliver in, in just a few moments. Um, the second one will be delivered by uh, Kelsey Jack. Um, she is a professor at Tufts. Um, the third will be delivered by Dan Levy. He's a professor at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, that's why, why Randomized. Um, the fourth, how to randomize, Joe Doyle. He's a professor here at the Sloan School uh, at MIT. Then we go into the mega lecture, sampling and sample size, which is, I'm sure, the main reason all of you are here is because you just wanted to attend this one, and I don't blame you. So our executive director, Rachel Glenister, will go over that. Um, then we have one of kind of the founders of this RCT movement, and interestingly, unlike a lot of us who are based in um, econ departments, he's a political scientist, although he has, he's an economist as well. Um, he will be taking you through uh, threats and analysis. So even after we've designed our perfect experiment, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. He'll talk you through that. Uh, let's see, then Rachel will talk about generalizability. And then Sally Hudson, um, who is an exiting PhD here, she'll be joining University of Virginia pretty soon, will take you through a project start to finish. So that, those are the lectures. Then we'll have uh, case studies. Um, we'll have four case studies um, that you will work on uh, in your groups. So Rohit already told you that you have your, um, on your name tag is your group assignment. Uh, we'll ask you to uh, raise your hand when we go through each of the, the TAs to, to introduce the groups. Um, we have a few exercises that are like little Excel exercises or using little software, which are similar to case studies, but you don't actually have to read too much. Um, and it's not much about discussion. It's more about playing on, on your laptop. So does everyone here have a laptop? Does everyone here, who here has a Mac? All right. So we have forward-thinking people, but unfortunately, some of the software won't work on your laptop, so we'll, we'll make sure you're in a group with someone who has a PC. Um, and then I think the most important part of this course is the group work where, with your group, you're going to today decide what is the project that you would like to evaluate. And over the course of this week, you will design the evaluation of that project. So then let me introduce one final entity, and that is JPAL. Um, so I'm sure all of you knew about JPAL a little bit um, before you applied to join this course. But let me just give you kind of the standard pitch, just in case you haven't seen it before. So JPAL has 
three arms um, or three legs that it stands on. Uh, the first and kind of central role of JPAL is that it is a network of faculty affiliates um, who conduct randomized evaluations in the social sciences. Um, we have about kind of, kind of rapidly uh, closing in on about 150 um, faculty that we support. And how do we support them? We support them through um, partly through funding. Um, so we raise, we try to raise money um, to kind of create pots of money for faculty to apply to do uh, interesting research. We support them through research resources, which uh, Tom helps with quite a bit. Um, and the types of resources that we, we try to produce are basically you know, the latest and greatest in how to run randomized evaluations more and more efficiently. So we share like lots of code, lots of manuals. And I think the, the biggest effort that we do is we, um, we design staff training for all of the research assistants in our network. Um, and so then they, when they hit the ground, they're, they're not making it up as they go along as, as I did thir 13 years ago. Um, and then um, I think the, I th yeah, I think that's, that's what our, our oh, sorry, the third, the third part of what the, the research team does um, in helping uh, support evaluations is that we actually have regional offices um, in the different continents. And those regional offices in the country in which they're located kind of serve as the implementing, uh, research implementing organization. Um, so they hire the surveyors, uh, write contracts with the survey companies and, and whatnot, and just kind of, and then hire our research assistants on the ground. Um, so we produce a lot of research. Uh, I think at this point we're getting up to like 800 or more uh, completed and ongoing evaluations in our network. But our hope is that those evaluations do not land in academic journals only to be read by other academics and then not by kind of who we actually care about, which are the policymakers. So we have a policy group that works on a lot of policy outreach, uh, partly through translating um, the academic papers into English, because we all know that they're usually not in English, um, in Greek or other languages. Um, and, uh, and then kind of promoting a lot of the work uh, that we do. So a number of our policy people are here. They can tell you a little bit more about what they do on the day to day. And then the third uh, part is the training team. And that's kind of the team that, that um, I help uh, establish here at JPL. And, and our, our biggest role is to run courses like this. Um, we have courses like this. We have ones that are kind of specific on measurement. We have more academic ones for researchers. Um, but we do this not just here in Cambridge. This is, I think, our 13th course in Cambridge. Um, but we have, uh, we've done over, I think, 50 of exactly this course all over the world in our different regional offices and over 100 kind of custom courses for um, specific partners if they request kind of to have a number of their staff trained on, on this business. And so we'll, we'll work with them to do that. All right, so we have offices in North America, Latin America in Chile, um, in Africa in Cape Town, in Europe, in Paris, uh, in Jakarta, and in um, India, in Delhi. So those are our offices. So let me just say, um, I think you all know uh, that JPAL did not invent RCTs. Um, we are not the only players in this game, obviously. There are like, you know, hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, clinical researchers out there that are doing RCTs. Um, but in terms of kind of where we fit in the history of conducting RCTs, promoting RCTs, um, I'd say that we're not irrelevant. Um, so what is the history of RCTs? I think um, the first known RCTs were identified in kind of the late 1800s. Uh, one was in homeopathic medicine. There was some like really boring experimental psychology uh, studies, like how can, can someone tell the difference between two very small amounts of weights if they're slightly different? Like really interesting research questions like that. Um, but it really took off in, um, in the early 20th century, really actually the 1920s is when you saw uh, um, RCTs being 
kind of not only practiced, but um, actively promoted in the areas of health, education, and agriculture. Um, so uh, uh, this uh, Ronald Fisher, um, he was a statistician um, at Rothamsted uh, Agriculture um, Research Station uh, in England. Uh, he was, I think, what many people consider the, the founder of, of RCTs in, in the social sciences and in the sciences. Um, so then in the US, we actually saw a huge number of RCTs in the US in social policy. They were not run by academics for the most part. I mean, they are, a lot of them had people that were uh, PhDs, but for the most part, they were kind of government sponsored, um, run by uh, consulting groups. And then we saw a huge uh, surge in experiments in developing countries in the mid-1990s. Now, this says j -PAL. j -PAL didn't exist yet, but many of the people that were running those experiments were then later to become j -PAL affiliates. Uh, I think the, the father of, of a lot of this movement in development space is, is Michael Kramer. Um, he's a professor at Harvard. So then, um, Innovations for Poverty Action was created in 2002. This is by Dean Carlin. He was a, an advisee of Esther Duflo. Um, and they coordinated very closely. So right when he created Innovations for Poverty Action, which was an NGO, which means it could open offices whenever it wanted, wherever it wanted. It wasn't tied to any university. Uh, J-PAL, uh, or sorry, the Poverty Action Lab was launched uh, right, right around that same time. And they both have the term uh, uh, poverty action in them, not by coincidence. They were meant to be confusing, and, and so people would know that they were kind of tied together. Um, then uh, Mr. Mohammed Abdul Latif Jamil uh, donated a bunch of money to MIT to both uh, sponsor uh, the professorship of, of Esther Duflo and to sponsor and to create an endowment for the Poverty Action Lab. And he asked us to name it after his father. So we became the Jamil Poverty Action Lab. Um, then we started open, opening regional offices in South Asia in 2007. J-PAL Europe uh, in 2008, and then um, the Center for uh, Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley was created to kind of be the equivalent of a J-PAL um, in the UC system in California. Um, we opened J-PAL Latin America in 2009, and then another kind of partner similar researchy type organization, uh, Evidence for Policy Design, was established at uh, Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School. Uh, J-PAL Africa in 2010, um, at which point the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan was established. Um, the director of this and this is the same guy, Asim Khwaja. Um, and then J-PAL North America and J-PAL Southeast Asia were established in 2013. All right, so we see, we track the uh, kind of the number of RCTs that were in international development, and it wasn't nothing. Um, in, in the early 80s, and it wasn't nothing in the 90s, but what we see is that when j -PAL and IPA are established, uh, there was a huge uptick. Now, this is not a causal claim. Um, we are going to learn about RCTs, and I cannot say that it was that before our j -PAL, it was that after j -PAL, therefore j -PAL is responsible for all of this. could be that we were just catching the train. All right, so we have many, many evaluations all over the world in many sectors. Um, and that is the end of my introduction of j -PAL. We can go into more detail offline. So what is evaluation? So this session, um, I think the, the, there's a couple um, objectives of this session. Um, the first objective is just to kind of motivate why we're all here, um, to, to help I don't know, convince you all that you, you got into this, you got yourself into this for a good reason. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about why it is that we want to evaluate. Um, many people have actually very different concepts of why it is that they want to do evaluation, and so we'll, we'll try to cover uh, the different perspectives on that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, we'll, we'll try to be uh, a bit more precise in our definition of what evaluation is. Um, evaluation is a very common term, and it means a lot of things to a lot of people. So 
uh, we'll try to be we'll try to narrow down the definition in terms of what we intend on talking about this week. Um, we'll briefly kind of ask some questions about what makes a good impact evaluation question, and then. Um, and we'll spend the most of, of this presentation on this, kind of walk you through the, the five different components of, of program evaluation. And so um, this will all become clear shortly. OK, so how are policies made? Um, in their book, uh, Poor Economics, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee uh, say that a lot of policies, especially in developing countries, but also here, a lot of them fail for a reason that they call the, the three I's. Ideology, ignorance, and inertia. Right? And so the, if, if you haven't read this book, it is an excellent book. I, I highly suggest you get it. Um, we used to pass it out until we had another book to pass out, which is, I think, more relevant for this course. Um, but basically, the, the idea is pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, some people make policies just because they, they believe it and it fits with their identity of, of kind of their, where they are on some political spectrum. Um, some people don't want to bother changing ineffective policies just because it requires work. Um, and I think what we'd like to say is ignorance is a strong word. Um, but the fact of the matter is that there's not a lot of good, hard evidence of which policies are working. And so it's hard to kind of promote or take down, promote an effective policy or take down an effective pol ineffective policy if we don't know which of those are actually effective. So putting your head in the, your, yourself in the head of a policymaker, and many of you are policymakers, so we like to kind of separate the world into um, the world of policy making. So this is the, the poor economics talks a little bit about why policies fail and then goes through a lot of evidence of which policies seem to be showing promise um, and, and give some good frameworks for thinking about that. But in terms of when you are making a new policy, what, are the, what is the thought process that, that you go through? Is it you know, you basically have an opinion of what works, of the way the world works. Um, is it very subjective? Or is it more objective? Is there kind of an evidence-based model? Do you have either like scientific, rigorous, quantitative evidence? Do you have non-rigorous quantitative evidence? Is it more qualitative evidence from research? Or is it more just kind of based on the experience, intuition, impressions? Um, or is it, you know, uh, expediency, uh, whatever is kind of politically convenient? So I'd like to ask you, I mean, these are kind of like the, the various reasons why policies are made. I'd like to ask you, how do you think policies are made? Now, now just, I don't necessarily mean this as kind of a, this is more of an opinion question. And this may be based on your experience in your position, previous positions. All right, wow, a lot of people say ideology. Um, I wonder if all of you are from the US. Um, who said that? I don't know. Um, does anyone want to share their thoughts and, and what they're thinking in, in terms of, of why they chose the, the option they chose or the options they chose? I can pick on someone randomly. Yeah, David. I chose B. Um, you know, I see a lot of decisions that are made in this city specifically um, that have a lot to do with historical experience of um, <coughs> decision makers and parties, et cetera. Um, but also my you know, nonprofit world, I see a lot of uh, E as well in the 
um, financial resources and constraints. Yeah. Now, is that is that a problem that it's based on experience? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be naive to expect that everyone shuts their eyes until someone put it, put some hardcore evidence in front of them, they open it and then make their decision. Obviously, that is just one of the inputs that should go into the policy making process. All right, so next question. Now, let's talk about producing evidence, producing some of the evidence that, that should go in, that we think should go into making policy. Who should make that evidence? Who should produce that evidence? OK. All right. So who said A externally and independent from the implementers? All right. Maureen, tell us. What were you thinking? Um, well, I think that's ideally how it should happen. You know, I think that would be the cleanest way to get a picture of whether it's working. I think the way it really happens is B or C more yeah. frequently. Um, and I think that if you're too closely integrated with the program implementers, you're going to be influenced by that. Fair enough. Anyone? <clears throat> All right, now who said B? Would they like to share their thoughts? I can go back to David, or I'll go to Henry. Just to Especially when if you're having the opportunity to help design a program and embedding that culture of evaluation and, and the right metrics that capacity of tracking the right metrics uh, is essential. If you, don't, if you don't set it up in that way, you're not going to be able to evaluate rigorously. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Something that can have an impact afterward, if not as the integrator, you don't have the buy-in from the implementers of the program itself. It's not going to inform any decisions moving forward. Yeah. So I think both of these are totally correct. I think it's very true that the more closely integrated you are, the more likely that you as, if you are an independent evaluator and you are, but you are closely integrated with the group, you will be influenced and, and you will be kind of motivated. You, you get to know them, you want their program to work, your people, you have a social interaction with them, you maybe feel the need to kind of if you find that your first run of the analysis shows that the program didn't work, you may be influenced to try it, looking at it a few different ways until you find something that works because you've been there and you feel that it actually works. So I think there is a big concern that the more closely integrated you are, the more, um, uh, the more likely bias might creep in. Um, that said, and, and James can tell you this, is that even if you're totally independent, if you're a researcher uh, or an academic, um, you may also want the program to work just because that helps your chances of getting published, right? Um, and, you know, that may be conscious, it may be subconscious, and, um, and it's just the reality of incentives, right? And so if you know that you are going to get something published, if you find a giant impact, you may stop going through iterations of analysis once you find that impact. But on the flip side, yeah, I mean, it is true that if the purpose of the evaluation is to, for the organization itself to learn and to make decisions based on the evidence that is being evaluated on, then yeah, if, if someone kind of flies in at the beginning, you know, introduces themselves, you know, puts some probes on people, you know, set up, sets up some camera to collect data, and then flies in two years later when the thing is over, and then just says, your program didn't work, Obviously, the implementing organization might, be, uh, might question how well that researcher knows uh, what is actually going on. So I think one of the very critical pieces of, of, um, of integrating the evaluation team with the, with the implementation team is A, there, there is some rapport that helps with the learning, but B, and probably more importantly, the evaluator is more likely to know what it is they should be evaluating, 
right? They should know not only the final outcomes that they're looking at, but exactly how the process works and where things might fail along the way, and, and that might give them, them little indications of what to measure along the way. Um, so I think the, the big dichotomy here, and, and it's interesting, in this group we actually have a lot of people that are working with governments and with NGOs. In the past, we've, uh, I'd say, a significant number of our US-based participants are donors. And when they're donors, a lot of them believe that it should be external, right? And for them, for many of them, the purpose of evaluation is accountability. You know, I'm funding something, I wanna know if it works, right? And I don't wanna know, um, I don't care as much about why it's working in the process of where things might break down and what might benefit this organization in the future. I just wanna know, is my money going to effective uh, policies? And so they really care about the accountability aspect, whereas a lot of the governments, NGOs, and, and others care about the learning aspect. So I'd like to ask you, who is the most important audience for your evaluation? So a lot of you are politicians and policymakers, and I think I think that uh, or that was your response, and I think that reflects I think a lot of the audience is that when you're working with governments, a lot of times these are the people that are making the calls, I guess. All right. So now I'm going to burn through this, uh, just defining what is evaluation, what do we mean when we say evaluation. Um, but first, I'm going to ask you another question, which is. What's the difference between monitoring and evaluation? Okay. Now, for those of you who said other, do you want to share, any of you share your thoughts? Yeah, Lane. I think of monitoring as making sure that um, the program is following whatever rules or parameters are set out in the regulations or, or policy around receiving their funding. Like, are they dotting the I's, crossing the T's, doing the right forms, et cetera, yeah. following the legal components, whereas evaluation is, um, it doesn't work. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, I, I would say monitoring is both for management and accountability. Um, you know, it's, it's how, um, I, ideally the way the, this like donor policy making or kind of if, if you're uh, um, allocating funds to a program, ideally before you allocate the funds, you wanna know whether the program in theory works not only just in theory, but maybe on a pilot scale, but then once you scale it up, the way you hold people accountable is through the monitoring. Um, and you might do that through what we call a process evaluation, which is very similar. Um, and, and, you know, the um, evaluation can be for accountability, but it can also be for learning. All right, so what is impact evaluation? So, we will spend almost all of our time talking about program evaluation and we will really dive in uh, into randomized evaluation. Impact evaluation is kind of in between those two things. And so, what does that mean? So evaluation can be anything. Um, you can have kind of a descriptive evaluation, like for example, you know, what is the incidence of 
Zika virus in Florida right now. Um, or maybe you want to, um, maybe I want course evaluations at the end of this. So I'm going to ask you for like a normative evaluation. What, do you th what did you think about this course? Was it, was it effective? Did it meet your needs and, and things like that? I guess we won't use the word effective. Did, did, you, did you like it? I can ask. Um, and then we could potentially have a question of specifically, you know, was this, pro, was this course effective in the goals that we set out? And so that might be something like a program evaluation. So our program or policy or intervention will, over the course of this week, you'll hear all three of those to basically mean the same thing, program, intervention, policy. Um, so if we have a policy um, that is implemented, uh, we want to evaluate that. You know, what is the, um, current prevalence of Zika virus is not really a program evaluation question, right? Um, but maybe if we enact steps to eradicate it, like we put money to eradicating it uh, or stopping its spread in the US, that we might want to evaluate using a program evaluation. It's the impact evaluation that is, does it work? Is it effective? And within impact evaluation, one of the methods of doing an impact evaluation is the randomized control trial or the randomized evaluation. And so where does monitoring fit in? I think monitoring is kind of a form of program evaluation that's not necessarily impact evaluation. Um, and so like we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, this in a little bit, um, process evaluation and monitoring can somewhat be used interchangeably. All right. So what types of questions can you ask, uh, answer with an impact evaluation? Like we said, um, evaluation in general can be descriptive, normative, or cause and effect questions. Impact evaluations is really about testing causal hypotheses, cause and effect questions. All right, so now I will kind of walk you through what a randomized evaluation looks like. Um, kind of what are the, where do you start and what is the, the process? And then that diagram that we'll use, we'll, we'll use it kind of over the course of this week to kind of place where each of the following sessions will go. All right, so first I think it's useful to um, segment a randomized evaluation into two major components, the design and the implementation. What we'll be talking about for the most part this week is the design. We'll talk about a little bit about both, but what you will be working on in your groups is the evaluation design. So where do you start? What is the first thing that you need uh, when doing a randomized evaluation? Any, any, any ideas? A problem, to solve. a problem to solve. An evaluation question, exactly. A causal hypothesis, I, right? And where does this causal hypothesis come from? Well, hopefully, it doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, hopefully, there's some theory, some thinking, some evidence that goes into framing your, uh, what your question is. Unless, of course, you're my son, and then I think he has like a random word generator in his mind, and he just spits out questions that have no basis in anything at all. So what is a causal hypothesis? It's basically that I believe that there is this intervention that will be run and touch this group of people and will change these outcomes. So these are kind of the three major components of your causal hypothesis. A cause, an effect, and on whom. So when you're doing a randomized evaluation, I hope that your target group is going to be the sample that you will be kind of tracking over the course of this evaluation. You're not tracking some group that's not affected by this evaluation. Um, and then you take your intervention and you randomly assign it to your target group. Or maybe you randomly assign your target group to receive the intervention, however you want to think about it. 
And in terms of seeing whether it's effective, at the end of the day, you need to measure outcomes. And you may do that um, in many cases by conducting a survey um, on your sample. Uh, that's not always the case. There's some cases where, um, you know, where you can just use existing data, administrative data, for example, standardized testing data can be how you measure outcomes, and then you don't actually have to administer a survey. But for a lot of the research that we do in in social sciences, we actually have to do we have to collect some primary data, um, and and Kelsey will will talk about that a little bit later. All right, so you take your sample, and you administer your survey, and you collect your data. And with your random assignment, you, know, you start your intervention. The intervention begins after random assignment, and you want to monitor. This is not to be confused with implementation monitoring. This is, um, this is monitoring that we, as evaluators, want to do just to make sure that our evaluation is happening as planned. Um, so we want to make sure that if we are assigning this group to get the intervention and this group to be a control group or a comparison group without the intervention, we want to make sure that the control group's not getting the intervention and that the people who are supposed to get it are. So we, we do our monitoring. And then we take our monitoring data and the collect data that we collected um, through our surveys and we do our analysis. We get our results. And if our results are conclusive, then we can update our theory of the way the world works. If they're inconclusive, we may have a new evaluation question ready for us. So this is kind of the, the framework that we'll be using for most of this course, um, just thinking about the different stages. And I'll, I'll revisit this at the end. So just to test whether we were paying attention, Right, through the theory of change. So in theory, I guess it could be through the evaluation question. Um, but yeah, basically, once we get the results of our evaluation, we now update or confirm our theory of change. All right, so now um, let me actually skip this. Um, how do we increase school participation? Um, government wants to increase participation. I won't ask you guys because we don't have much time left. But of course, it won't let me finish. All right. So, so the options were, you know, one way we could increase school participation, enrollment and attendance, is through textbooks, free lunch, free school uniforms. Um, we can in treat intestinal worms if they have it. That's not so much a problem in this country anymore. Um, it was in the South about 100 years ago. Uh, merit scholarships if we improve the quality of education, perhaps we can uh, get people to attend more because they think it's useful. Uh, providing better materials and increasing awareness. So we've actually run randomized evaluations on all these different interventions and measured them on, um, oh good, we got one response. Uh, measured them on um, uh, attendance and enrollment. And now this is where we get some hardcore evidence of like comparative cost effectiveness. We can see which is the most cost effective, but we see that these are all in kind of different locations, different contexts. So now we as decision makers have to decide, you know, if you provide information on the returns to education, how much, you know, each additional year will improve your income on average. Um, we find that that is a very cheap intervention in Madagascar. And it actually, this doesn't mean it increases education 40 years for one person, uh, or enrollment 40 years for one person, but kind of spread over many people. Um, for every $100 spent, so that means if each person, each child ended up going to school one year longer, um, 
that means we probably uh, were spending about two dollars a person. So, um, questions? Yeah, I, I just wonder. Yeah. It somehow, you know, seems to suggest that uh, you know, if you look at this chart, one works, the other one doesn't. But right. isn't the reality that it just you know, it worked in Madagascar, or the warming works in a world where worms are the issue, right? But you know, so isn't it purely co mutually contextual, you know, what you're trying to say? The proper thing would say, you know, it is effective in this and this and this situation. Absolutely, exactly. And so if this was all the evidence that we had, we would have to think, you know, if we were a policymaker, um, here in the US, or if we were the policymaker in Latin America, we'd have to decide which of these is actually relevant. So actually we do have, for example, a, a similar study on returns to um, information in the Dominican Republic. So maybe, and, and it has equally a very, well maybe not equally, but also it's considered to be very cost effective. Um, we need to decide whether in our context people um, are aware of how valuable it is. Uh, education is. So I think one of the preconditions for this to be effective in Madagascar is that people need to really underestimate the value of education. If we're in an area um, like, for example, I don't know, in, in parts of India, in, part in here, I think people in, in parts of East Asia, people are hyper, hyper aware of the value of education. And so this might not be effective. So that's where as a kind of decision maker, you need to take the evidence, see whether it applies. Rachel will be talking a lot about this. Um, in her what we call a generalizability lecture. So we have this evidence, does it generalize to our context? So yeah. Um, so anyways, yeah, so we have many questions, um, many, many potential causal hypotheses. We now have impact numbers on all of them and we have, uh, uh, we know how much each, each of them costs and we can do this comparison. Um, again, like with conditional cash transfers, there is question about whether or not the um, that conditional cash transfer should, should be only um, evaluated based on its outcome on enrollment and attendance, given that it is a social protection program. It's actually meant to deliver cash to poor families for many reasons, and this is just one small thing. So a lot of things uh, need to go into your, um, this is not a prescription of what you should do. This is just a piece of evidence. Okay. So what makes a good impact evaluation question? We have a few of these, but I'm just going to ask one for now, and then we will continue on. Correct. This is a causal question. All right, so I don't need to go through the rest. All right, so now we will very rapidly breeze through the different components of program evaluation. So the very first component is a needs assessment. Does the problem even exist? There are a lot of policies and programs that are, um, that are created to tackle a problem that may not exist. So for example, say you're in some, I don't know, pick any country in the world and you think voter fraud is a huge issue. And therefore you are going to implement policies to ensure that there is a lot less voter fraud. Um, you may need, all you need to do is perhaps a needs assessment to find that actually voter fraud is not an issue at all. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do an impact evaluation. Um, then once you have your, kind of, you've established that the problem actually exists and you can do this maybe through desk research. Maybe you actually need to go and collect data. Um, maybe you can do some qualitative research as well. Um, but once you have a, a theory that the problem exists, you kind of have to back out and figure out why it exists and what are potential solutions of tackling it. And so that's where your theory of change comes in. 
Theory of change has many different names. Uh, I, there's many different methods of doing something that's very equivalent to theory of change. So a logical framework analysis or log frame is another one, and there are many other terms. Then you made, you're implementing your intervention. You want to do a process evaluation to make sure, or monitoring, to make sure that it's actually happening as planned. If you want to do an impact evaluation to see whether it's effective, you can do that. And then at the end, you could do a cost effectiveness analysis. All right. So an example might be water uh, in, in water sanitation and health. So let me ask you, what do you think is in, if your context is East Africa, what do you think is the most cost effective way to reduce diarrhea? Increase the supply of and demand for chlorine. Okay, that's the, the most common response. And then education on sanitation and health. Right. So these these are various options that we can use. So first, if we're going to do a needs assessment, let's make sure that the problem exists. So we um, and and that you know what are the potential sources of the problem. So we do find that the problem exists. Um, you know, diarrhea is one of the leading killers of children in the world. So what do we think is the, the source of this problem? And this we might be able to measure through a needs assessment. Maybe go into the villages in eastern Kenya and, and what seems to be the problem here? This is where this child is collecting water. There's other things that are in the water, and there's really nothing stopping these other things from getting in the water. So, you know, people, things could be flying in. You can tell that there's, you know, water could be running in through, you know, who knows where the water, the rainwater is coming from. It could be going through um, agricultural areas, which are maybe fertilized by organic fertilizer, like feces, and all that kind of E. coli is getting into the water. So that is a potential problem. So we can see that there is a clear source of a problem here. All right. So now we have our theory of change of how we might fix it. Let's, what happens, um, let me quickly go through this. Here's a potential way of stopping stuff from leaking into the water. You can encase your spring in concrete and create a pipe so that, you know, the child is not dipping his hands into the water to pull out water, and if his hands have you know, fecal matter on it, then it's not infecting. Here it's just coming through a pipe. So this is one potential solution. But there are other potential solutions. Maybe the issue has to do with hygiene, or lack of chlorine, or lack of knowledge about washing your hands. Maybe, it's, maybe that water isn't actually as polluted as we think. Right? So there is some evidence to suggest that indeed there are other solutions, and they may be relevant. So for example, um, Many, some, some researchers have suggested that hygiene is actually the major issue. It's not about clean water. And if you have hygiene, then everything, if you fix the hygiene problem, then any, everything else flows through. Others say, you know, what, let's just use chlorine. Or it's going to be very expensive to do all of those springs, you know, encase all of those springs in, in concrete. What happens if we just give people chlorine? They can sterilize their water. All right. So a theory of change might look something like this. We want less diarrhea. Our theory is that diarrhea comes mostly from com contaminated water. And if, you have, uh, if contaminated water is the primary source of illness and people drink clean water, then you'll have less diarrhea. So what goes into them drinking clean water? Well, they have to choose to drink clean water, which means they probably have to understand the benefits of clean water. They have to know which of water is clean. So if they have multiple sources to choose from, they have to choose the clean water. 
they have to have access to clean water um, at their home, so when they're drinking their water, which means they probably have to have at good access to clean water at the source where they're getting their water from. Um, they have to choose to drink only clean water. There has to be no recontamination, which means that you have to have an effective means of cleanly extracting the water, good hygiene practices, and sufficient water. So our concrete encased uh, theory of change, our, uh, our intervention, is based on the theory of change that really the primary source of the issue is that people don't have access to clean water at source and that they need a clean method of extracting the water. And that some of these other things are assumptions. So we assume that people will make all the right decisions otherwise. All right, so this is a log frame. This is basically giving you the exact same information in this four by four matrix. Um, you could, but we'll, we're, we're not gonna cover log frame in this course, but uh, just so you know. And all the different parts of program evaluation will be part of this. All right, so now you want, you've decided you're going to encase your um, springs in concrete. Now you just gotta monitor that it's happening. So you may, you know, you may have like a, a logistics management or a, you know, law, a Gantt chart, some kind of project process to, to make sure things are happening as planned. And this is where monitoring may play a part. Now the interesting thing is that monitoring, as we said, may be something that an external evaluator is doing or an evaluator is doing, but it may be just something that is part of your intervention. When you're doing your program, you have a checklist and you're tracking that you know, concrete is being purchased and it's being sent to the right place. So now you measure how well it works and that's your impact evaluation. And your causal hypothesis was concrete and case springs will decrease rates of diarrhea. That was your causal hypothesis. And so what did we see? What was the impact of this program? Well, there was a 66% reduction in source water E. coli, 24% reduction in household E. coli contamination, 25% reduction in incidence of diarrhea. And so now we have some evidence that this program works. But we still have many other options of things that we could have done. Hand washing, home chlorine distribution, and, uh, source chlorine dispensers, piped in cleaning water, uh, sorry, piped water. So just, just have there not be a source, have the source and the, the household supply be the same. So then you need to kind of weigh what are the potential benefits of each and, and, and how cost effective is each potential solution. So again, you can use a cost effectiveness diagram to help decide. And what we found is that free chlorine dispensers at the water source is the most cost effective uh, solution. All right, so now we're done with this session. What we're going, we talked about why evaluate and what is evaluation. Um, later with Kelsey Jack, we'll talk about measurement. So looking at our outcomes. Dan Levy will talk through why randomize. Uh, Joe Doyle will talk about how to randomize. Rachel Glenister about sample and sample size. Um, Don Green will talk about post-design challenges and uh, otherwise known as threats. Oh, sorry. And then uh, generalizability and start to finish. So this is the course overview. Thank you. Sorry about going into your break. Um, I think we can lead into the next section uh, session a little bit. All right. Thanks.